Okay, repeat after me. Slow water down and drought fire floods. Those two concepts we're going to repeat a million times. Trees create rain and not the other way around. There's just so much to learn about water in all its forms, what it does when it's part of a healthy water cycle, either big or small, and what it does when it isn't massive floods we see around the world at the moment. In this interview, we try to start to unpack the massive role water plays in heating and cooling our planet and argue why we should absolutely pay more attention to water and the water cycles. Potentially, it's more important and relevant in the climate discussion than carbon. Did I just say that? Yes, I did. So enjoy. If it's true that water vapor accounts for 60 to 70% of the greenhouse effect, while CO2 only accounts for 25, why do we rarely discuss it? Maybe we choose to ignore it because it means we literally need to revegetate the entire earth. Bring back the marshes, the mangroves, the perennial pastures with trees, and regrow real forests that can bring back rain in strategic places. In short, bring back life, lots of plants, trees, animals back to many places on this earth. Natural climate engineering. It is time we take our role as keystone species super seriously. In this special water cycle series, we interview the dreamers and the doers who are using the latest technology to figure out where to intervene first. They're making or trying to make the investment and return calculations and plans. So what's missing? What's holding us back? Maybe we lack the imagination to back them and try regeneration at scale. We're thankful for the support of the Nest family office in order to make this series. The Nest is a family office dedicated to building a more resilient food system through supporting natural solutions and innovative technologies that change the way we produce food. You can find out more on the Nest FO, that is nestfo.com. Welcome to another episode. Today with physicist and writer of the Climate Water Project that you definitely can find on Substack. I will link it below. Welcome, Alpha. Hi, glad to be here. And I'm very much looking forward to, to this conversation and, and the whole series, honestly, we're in the middle of around water cycles. Um, but I would love to start with a personal question. How did you end up, because I already mentioned physicist, not necessarily focused on water cycles, I think, uh, to to begin with when you're in university, how did you end up uh, going very deep? Because if you follow your Substack, super accessible, by the way, but it still goes very deep um, into, into the water cycle space. Yeah, I've been kind of uh, working in permaculture and doing some regeneration on land. And, um, and when the wildfires hit California, which is where I'm from, um, I thought there must be some permaculture solution. And I saw Zach Weiss's work about hydration and I mean, he was reporting, uh, I think Anastasia's work, um, Makareva's work. Um, but he was saying that the, there's a, there's a small water cycle and that we can actually increase the rain. And so I thought there, there should be ways of possibly utilizing, um, these land management methods that might be able to increase rain or create ways of holding water in the soil longer to fight the fires. And then the more I delved into it, I was like, wow, there's a lot of things happening with the climate and with the environment that have to do with the water cycle. Um, and, you know, and previously as a physicist, I'd studied water, but not on the macroscopic, but so I had some interest in water. And uh, so I got curious and the more and more I delved into it, the more I was like, my goodness, water is a huge part of the climate. And so, you know, carbon is important part of the whole climate equation too, but water is actually this huge part that not enough people are talking about. So I then, you know, applied my permaculture background and my physics background to delve more into this. Perfect. Yeah, you, you mentioned already a lot of interesting concepts we have to unpack and, and Zach Wise, which we had on the podcast before, which I will link below and Anastasia, which we'll have hopefully in, in a month or so or whenever you're listening to this, it should be online already. You just interviewed her. Um, I, I haven't been able to listen to that yet, but it, I read uh, the Substack, which is very detailed, very graphic, a lot of interesting pictures and, and concepts. So I will link that below as well. But let's start with um, a few things you mentioned, small water cycle, which suggests that there's a big one as well. And um, we've talked about it, but it was a long time ago with Zach. So let's uh, repeat and, and uh, emphasize it a bit more. Um, what is a water cycle to begin with and why there are two different ones? 
Yeah. So um, water on Earth is very interesting. It actually is in this non-equilibrium state. It's always constantly going up into the air where it forms rain and then it comes back down, um, which it doesn't do on other planets. Um, and and um, so there's a large water cycle where it's coming in from the ocean. Um, the moisture blows into the ocean. But then there's also, and then when it falls to the land, the land can absorb some of that rain and then evapotranspire. Evapotranspire means the you know, the water is either being released by the plants or the soil um, up into the air or by lakes. And that, that combines with the water blowing in from the ocean. Um, and so, you know, it's so, just, so the big one is just to interrupt is, is basically what we learn in school. It, it rains somehow we'll get into that. Why, but, um, water flows down either through a river system or, uh, or elsewhere gets into the ocean, uh, gets up again and, and repeats. That's the big one. Yeah. But there's a much more important, smaller one actually that we don't really talk about, or at least not outside the water cycle geeks, let's say, or the water cycle bubble. Um, which is doesn't influ it doesn't include the oceans or big water bodies. It includes mostly vegetation that basically sweat and, and evaporate a lot of water and, and it starts looping as well, which is a, a shorter one. That's why it's called the small water cycle. Yeah. And it can be, you know, it can be anywhere from 10% to 80% of the uh, cause of the massive. Rain. Yeah. So, um, so places where like California, it's a little bit less because um, a lot of that's coming from the ocean, but places like China, a lot more of it is coming from the ground. So, so the small water cycle, you know, maybe on average, it's about 40 to 50% around the world, um, the small water cycle. And in the climate, the climatologists have also been studying this. They call it precipitation recycling. And actually, because it's been independently discovered various times in atmospheric science and climate science, it's also called moisture recycling or moisture feedback or precipitation feedback. So multiple people have come up with different terms. And it's interesting in the permaculture and the kind of regenerative agriculture, people talk about the small water cycle, the climate scientists talk about precipitation recycling, and they don't know that sometimes they, they don't know this other demographic is actually studying the same thing or talking about the same thing. And, and why do the climate scientists talk about this? Because, well, because we mostly talk about carbon in, or, and other emissions, like the carbon equivalent, the, the famous little e at the end of a lot of CO2, uh, uh, CO2 statements. Yeah. Well, the climate scientists are studying water a lot. I mean, it is a big part of atmospheric science um, because, uh, well, for one, the whole heating up, the carbon heats up, but then it draws in the water vapor into the air and that affects the temperature too. So even to do the basic temperature calculations, you have to take into account the water cycle. Um, and then, you know, atmospheric scientists are very interested about rain, you know, droughts and floods and all this. And so they're studying the water cycle a lot too. Um, and, it, you know, um, there's some, uh, Dutch, uh, scientists in particular, they've been really pushing this precipitation recycling, um, van der Ent and, uh, and, uh, Hubert Seven Neji. And they, they, they actually mapped out, uh, how much each, each country and where it is, how much it's the small water cycle or the precipitation recycling is playing a part in the rain. And they're like, we really need to get the climate scientists focused a lot more than this. So there are people in climate science that are really saying, Hey, how come our field is not focusing enough on the hydrological cycle? And, and then within your, your writing and publishing, because you're not just writing, I mean, you're recording podcasts as well and, and do, doing a lot of drawing as well. Um, what, what do you mostly focus on it? Why did you call it Climate Water Project uh, on, on Substack? What was the, the, what's the, the reasoning behind the title? Um, well, right now, one of the big you know, existential threats <laughs> and problems for the world is the climate. And, um, and I wanted to put some emphasis on that part of the equation of the water because uh, I think the part on the land, it's, it's a lot more, at least it's a lot, been a lot more understood. Um, but, the, but I think people are not always connecting what's happening on the land with water with what's happening in the climate. But because there's a coupling between the land and the climate through the trees and the lakes and the, you know, the soil that's evapotranspiring, there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a very important thing. So I wanted to focus on that. And so what is that important connection? We, I mean, we've had Walter Yenna um, on the show a while back, I'm thinking two and a half years almost, um, or at least more than two, but I, I will link it below as well, who basically said, stop focusing too much on carbon. Uh, there's there's a water vapor to, to focus on and a water cycle to focus on as we've devegetated pretty much most of the earth or at least large quantities. Um, how would you describe why this, this evaporation is so important and not only to create rain, which it does, and we'll get to that, but also in this heating and cooling 
um, that we're in the middle of and, and being hit by, as we're talking, uh, end of May, beginning of June 2023. There are droughts everywhere and floods everywhere. And the fire season hasn't really started anywhere yet, I think, but actually some places for sure. Like it seems definitely we're off balance. So why is that that vapor part and that evaporation part so, imp so important um, also for heating and cooling? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, well, when the rain comes down, it can flow all the way back into the ocean. But if you slow that water, say if you have more forest or soil that's more absorbent, it stays in the land for longer. And then when it evapotranspires, it can evapotranspire there's more water left on the land to actually evapotranspire. If you can imagine, um, it's like there's a certain amount of water on our continents, but if it's all rushing out during the during the winter during the wet season, then there's less water there to evapotranspire. And that evapotranspired water combines with the moisture blowing inland from the ocean to create rain. So you're going to affect the amount of rain. Um, on your in land. the dry season, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, you're by missing the evapotranspire effect because you don't have vegetation, you don't have full grown forests, um, et cetera, et cetera, basically rushing down the water when it falls and it does fall, but then it creates floods and everything, uh, it rushes to the ocean. It's basically lost and you lose that effect of 10%, 20, 30, 40, 50, 80%, whatever it is, um, depending on where you are. Um, so you miss the rain part as well which means you get even less water coming down. So it becomes sort of a, a negative cycle. Yeah, you can think, but it, there's an interesting way because the rivers can still have the same amount of water going out to the oceans, but if you slow it down, you actually have more water on the land. So an analogy, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but analogy is to think there's a museum, right? And people coming into the museum at the same rate and then they're leaving at the same rate. But if they're just seeing the pictures in one room and then leaving immediately, then there's not going to be that many people in the museum. But if they stay in the museum for like, two, three hours for a long time, you can, then they go back out. The, the in rate into the museum and the out rate is the same in both cases. But in the first case, there's a lot fewer people in the museum. In the second case, there's a lot more people in the museum. And it's the same with the water on the land. If it's slowed down, because when it goes, if the soil is holding it, so it's slower to go out, you still have the rivers um, flowing, but with the same amount total going out, but it, it ends up being a lot more water on the land. So it's a little bit of a counterintuitive thing, but it's yeah, because you get this competition fear thing like, yeah, but if my land or my my neighbor's land, my my upstream, whatever, uh, holds the, the water longer, it means there's less water for me or there's less water in the river, people downstream, etc. But that, of course, doesn't change. But the rule is or the, the, the aim should be slow down as much as possible. And you have longer water probably as well in the season, depending on where you are, if you have issues, let's say later in the in the dry season with your with your river flows. Yeah. So yeah. So one of the things with river flows that people don't always realize is that it's coming up from the aquifers too, and the groundwater is feeding the rivers in the dry season. So if it just flows over the land as runoff, then it flows out all during the wet season, and you don't have much left for the dry season. But if you can actually slow the water um, so that it kind of sinks in and goes underground, then it can come out two, three, four, five months later during the dry season, so your rivers can keep running. So. It's, it, it's, an, it's a way to keep your landscape hydrated more during the um, dry season. And also, if your aquifers are high enough so that the tree roots can reach it, the tree roots, it's called hydraulic redistribution, can bring up that water during the dry season. And then the mycelia can actually pass it to other trees who maybe don't have deep enough roots to get to the, to the groundwater table. Um, and so that keeps it all hydrated. And then that, some of that can actually then evapotranspire into the dry season too. So... So it actually lessens the extreme. Um, uh, that sort of da dampens the, 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 the crazy peaks that we're seeing now everywhere. Yeah, you can think of groundwater, uh, kind of like the ocean too. Uh, groundwater, because they're huge bodies of water, the groundwater is m way more water than the surface water. It's like a buffer. So um, they did studies in the Amazon rainforest. During the wet season, the tree roots actually push down water into the, into the groundwater. And then during the dry season, they'll pull it up. And so you're basically creating a more um, more even amount of water. It's about ten percent. And of course, that for that you need trees. You need perennial crops among them trees with deep roots, deep systems to be able to play that sort of um, the pump to go up and the pump to go down, depending on on, on the water source. So 
slow down, make sure it gets stored. And, and when in the dry season you need it, it will come up. If you have perennial crops, it will, it will, which is a sort of counter to the thing that in a dry season, the aquifer can lead to a continuous streaming river. But we've seen that many times in, in history. Yeah. Yeah, it is a little bit counterintuitive. Like water is weird. Let's just say it. Water is weird. <laughs> so yeah, this whole slowing water, it's like it has counterintuitive good uh, properties. And so it, there's this phrase that's spread through the permaculture and uh, agriculture, eco- agroecology world, um, invented by Brock Dolman. He called it "slow it, sink it, spread it." Um, and then he he has been proposing, as long with Erica w- Geese, who wrote uh, "What Water Wants," a, a slow water movement. Um, and I think it's really good because if we can kind of focus, I think it's a catchy phrase, slow water, um, because uh, there's actually a slow food movement and a slow money movement. Um, and it kind of, you know, it kind of connotes a little bit, the slowness kind of like connotes a little bit, let's connect back into the rhythms of nature and slow down. But it's actually a key aspect. Um, you know, it's one, if you try to summarize the whole thing you want to do with water, slow water might be a very good way of summarizing it. Which is a good title maybe for, for the series. Yeah. So, and then you mentioned vegetation leads to rain, which already it sounds counterintuitive from what we always learned. I think we always learned like, okay, rain leads to vegetation and um, like there's no forest without rain. We're going to go much deeper into the, the, um, with Anastasia and with others, of course, but this, I, I feel like we cannot repeat enough that, that there is a, a, like that rain is created very differently than we learn in school. So how, how does rain um, how does rain get gets created or triggered? That maybe is a better word. Um, and and why is that so different from what we we always learned in school? Like heavy clouds and then they fall down, etc. And then it rains. It, it's slightly different, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you're right. Um, well, it's interesting in like some of this uh, you know regenerative world, people do talk about forests creating rain, but the scientists didn't really believe that until uh, you know after the 2000s when they started measuring, say, in the Amazon you can measure the isotopes of water. And the isotopes of water, if they travel all the way from the ocean, is actually different than if it comes from closer, like from a forest. So did they captured the raindrops and they could basically tell the source. Yeah, where so does they this could tell drop that come from? at the onset of the wet season, the forests actually were evapotranspiring. They're almost like triggering the onset of wet season. And so, um, yeah, because they could see that the water had come from the forest to create the rain. Um, and then... Um, from like forest downstream or downwind, probably. Yeah, like like where the, the the this this sky river came from. So they could basically see, okay, this this drop came from not from the ocean, but it came from something much closer. Yeah. So so climate science has begun re- rewriting. I mean, and also the people doing the precipitation recycling, the small water cycle, had been saying this too. But it's it's now kind of becoming a bit more seeping into the mainstream climate science. That, oh yeah, forests do create rain. Um, and there's a there's actually a number of aspects that uh, also uh, may be influencing this. So um, David Sands, he discovered, um, I think in the 70s or 80s, um, that bacteria were starting to, um, that they could float up in the air and actually seed rain. And then the people discovered that fungi spores could too, and then also lichen, um, some of those molecules. So they could float up in the air currents and then seed the rain. So rain, when a, a water vapor when it's in the air, it needs to be above um, saturation, humidity, but it also needs something to nucleate it to form rain. And so, and, and this is still a bit of a nascent field, but it, it seems like there's also, uh, you know, little microorganisms that can seed the rain. And so in the forest, you have more of these. So that's one aspect um, that's also- whoa, whoa, whoa. Let, let's, let's, let's double click on that. So the, the forest not only transpire um, water molecules, but also certain bacteria, certain you mentioned a few other um, um, organisms that trigger the rain. Like without that, even if you have a very "quote unquote" heavy cloud, it, it, as long as it has, it doesn't have these um, uh, these organisms, rain is not triggered. Which means, literally, the forest not only creates the rain but also triggers the rain. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's still a bit of a nascent field of study because I mean, there are other things that trigger the little things in the air too, like dust and other things. You know, pollution and other things can trigger the rain too. But it seems like when you have more vegetation, it, it more of these microorganisms can go in the air. And so, um, so that can play a role. And then another thing that can play a role that Francina Dominguez, uh, a climatologist at University of Illinois, has been studying is that the forests create a turbulence. So when wind is blowing along, it can be blowing very fast, right? But 
if it doesn't slow down enough, it's hard for the water vapor molecules to find each other and to nuclear into rain. So if you can slow that air down. And so what- So not only do the water we have to slow down, but also the air. Yeah, so the forests kind of create this turbulence and it can go up to a kilometer like this turbulence. And so it's slowing down enough. And her, her simulations show that the forest can slow down the wind enough to create rain. Um, so that's another aspect. And then there's also the Anastasia Makareva um, uh, and uh, Viktor Gorshov theory about the biotic pump. Um, and that's also a bit, you know, it's, it's debated. It hasn't it's merged into climate yeah. science, but, uh, but it has, if you go into the physics, it, it, there's a lot of it that makes sense. Um, so their theory is that when you have a lot of water vapor, it flows into the air. And then when it condenses, so water vapor is 2000 times the volume of liquid water. So you suddenly have this kind of partial vacuum. You still have the other gases there, but you, the, all, everywhere the water vapor is gone. So it's like a vacuum. Um, and if you do this with an oil drum, you put steam in it and then you cool it down. That's your, your steel oil drum would just implode. I mean, that's that much power. Yeah. So it's a huge amount of power. Um, and people developing the steam engine in the, you know, early, a uh, long time ago, they would have all sorts of injuries because things were imploding all the time when the steam condensed. And so the same thing's happening in the clouds. And, uh, and, and it pools basically. Yeah. So it can, and something has to pool. fill up the vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. And so that creates this huge, um, pool and what their, their work is saying is that this can create a tap into the atmospheric cycle, the large water cycle that's coming in from the ocean. Um, they can increase that flow. Um, the traditional atmospheric science view of how we create that flow is that the land heats up and that creates the air rising. And so then that triggers the whole thing. And so they're not disagreeing with that. They're just saying that this added effect. Um, and then when they published it, some other atmospheric scientists, they said, well, the latent heat effect when clouds, because of the water vapor, when it condenses also releases heat, well, that, uh, that causes the clouds to heat up and release heat and that, that causes further uprising. And so that, that's also how thunderstorms create. And so that, and so that's the standard reason for how we create thunderclouds and thunderstorms. And um, Macri even like on, a, on a warm summer day, late afternoon, that's, that's how we think about the, the thunder, basically. Yeah. Uh, in many places of the world. So, so, uh, so yeah, let me just continue. So, so they, were, they were saying that, yes, they don't disagreeing that that's also a big effect, but they're saying that in the whole atmospheric cycle of the large water cycle, because you're heating up the water, it then the air, it then takes longer to uh, come down again. And so that, so in terms of speeding up the whole atmospheric cycle, it doesn't play a big effect. Locally it does, but it, but the, but whereas the biotic pump pop, the, the condensing of that water vapor to create the vacuum, that, that will actually drive the whole atmospheric cycle. And so, um, and, and they're saying that the forests know when the, it, they do it at the end of dry season, the start of wet season, because that's when the extra water evapotranspired by the forest can actually push the amount of water vapor in the air over the, the humidity point, um, the saturation point, so that it can then create more of this condensation and drive the thing. So it's really key when you do it, like you need to kick the system right. You, you kick the system right at that point so you initiate wet season. That's what the scientists studying the isotopes of water in the Amazon found, that it seems like the trees are releasing uh, the, a lot just at the start of the wet season to kind of initiate the wet season, which is a very different to nudge story. the whole system into place. Yes, and and but I, I imagine it also depends how you do it. And I'm I'm saying you and the the plural you, including the trees, um, because a forest is not a forest. Like this, I think this the theory starts to show, or the practice starts to show as well. Like this is not a monoculture tree plantation. Um, they release very different um, isotopes, etc. They release very different organisms compared to a very full grown Amazon. Uh, rainforest so there's a which is also called rainforest for a good reason um but like does the um, maturity or also the like the, let's say the biodiversity or the diversity of the forest um how what, what is research saying there in terms of what what kind of trees do we need to plant to kickstart this or where and how or what does the research say that yeah so um so some recent research has found that if you have more biodiverse forests as opposed to monoculture forests you have 30 percent extra organic matter in the soil. Um, and so that's huge because that means when the rain does fall down, you actually can hold each, each um, extra 1%. Um, but it, yeah, so when you have extra organic uh, matter in the soil, it can absorb way more um, 
Yeah, it's 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 I think twenty thousand gallons per, he- yeah, per so acre. So the, the, the number isn't enormous. Google it if you want to find it, but it's it's yeah, yeah, it's so very each, important. Each one percent, yeah, each one percent yeah. of organic matter increase increases the twenty thousand gallons per acre foot of how much it can absorb. And so, um, so anyway, so so they increase the amount of uh, it can absorb a bit um, in the in the forest. So, so that means that, and if if we, if you look at if you just go outside and you know there's not tree forest like. It, when you get in the dry scene, the soil is all dry. But if you go into the forest, you can look under the leaves and dig a little inch. And, like the soil can be still wet. Um, and that's because the forest is able to hold, you know, a lot of that wetness in. And so that's key. So, um, so it's, it's holding into the dry season. And so that helps it then have enough water to evapotranspire to trigger, um, to trigger the wet season. And in the addition, wet season, that's right. yeah, um, there's also that hydraulic redistribution effect I was talking about where the tree roots can also bring up the water that's stored in the groundwater up during that thing. And that's really, that, this is another effect that, I mean, the, soil, the, the land atmosphere connection has been, coupling has been not studied enough, but the groundwater atmospheric study, I mean, Francina Dominguez is one of the climate scientists studying, has been very little studied, um, but the groundwater is affecting the rain too. And so that's, that's an important thing we have to think about. Basically, we have to think about it as a, Three level connected system: um, the atmosphere, the land, and the groundwater. And 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 that's why we have to actually marry some of these sciences. The hydrogeologists need to be talking more to the climate scientists. Need to be talking to more the regenerative soil, you know, permaculture, regen ag people because they're all the, these levels are connected, you know. And have you seen? a growing interest in those connections. I mean, since you started the Substack, but also, of course, devastating fires in, in California followed a couple of years later, like the beginning of this year with devastated floods. Like, do you see a shift in in attention and, and interest to go literally deeper into this and, and look for root causes and, and root solutions? Or has it been, um, sorry, pun intended, relatively superficial? Um, I think that the connection between land and groundwater has been during the recent California floods, there were more people talking about, oh, we need to guide more of this because it's a huge amount of water, but because our land is not able to absorb it all, uh, it could have had better soil and other things. People were talking about more how to recharge the aquifers, um, but uh, the, the connection to the atmosphere wasn't talked about. Yeah, that, that this basically drought, fire, flood cycle that has been going on for, for a long time in many places, but it's very destructive and then it also triggers each other, basically, um, and, and sort of becomes a downward spiral um, if, if you want, unless you intervene and, and, and spread or slow down the water, spread it, and, and with that, re-vegetate. Yeah, so, the, so yeah, so you bring up a very important thing that I think if, if there's one, if there's two things that really people should focus on. One is slow water, and the other is this drought, fire, flood cycle. Um, and they, these things just need to be marketed the heck out of. Um, uh, Let's start here. We have a small audience, but let's so, start so here. Yeah, okay. So in Australia, drought, fire, flood. They had you know droughts in two thousand one to think two thousand eight, and then they had fires in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Huge, went some of the biggest fires, and then they had floods. I think two thousand eleven, and then they had huge droughts. Um, you know, two thousand twelve to two thousand you know eighteen. And these are rough numbers. Um, and then they had uh fires again in two thousand eighteen nineteen, and then they had floods again in two thousand twenty one. But people weren't connecting and this is happening in Greece in California and we had you know we had droughts and we had uh fires and then this early this year with floods Spain just recently yeah. I think they skipped the fire part but they had an 8 month drought and a massive floods now at northern Italy the same the yeah. whole winter was dry they skipped luckily the fire uh, one for now uh, also because there're not so many trees left um but the floods haven't been less destructive <laughs> Yeah uh British Columbia they had uh droughts and then they had fires and then they had floods and then Brazil is having those three and so this is a, a pattern all around the world and for some reason uh, I, I, the only person I know who's promoting it is Zach Weiss and he's calling it the watershed death spiral um, but it's it somehow and this is a, we need to get a lot more of the climate scientists because I think what they do is they focus on one thing but they haven't actually and that's part of this whole thing of the systems thinking they haven't seen that there's a connection and so let me just explain the connection between the three so the drought um, well obviously dries up everything so that so that it creates fires is not is is pretty obvious, but the floods to fire a fire to floods is not quite so obvious. But what if you if your fires get too intense, like traditionally in nature, you do have fires and they're smaller scale. But if it gets too intense, what happens is that this waxy coating happens on the soil, 
And so that means that um, the soil is no longer going to absorb the rain as much. Um, so that's one problem is that then two years later after your fire, um, the, when the rains come, they're just going to flow downhill and they'll cause huge floods below. Um, and then the other thing is that the fires can, you know, destroy some of the vegetation that's holding in the soil. And so what happens in floods is that there's so much water and maybe it's stopped further uphill, but then it accumulates and it just creates these landslides that triggers more bigger landslides. And so you, you need to kind of like, um, after, after a fire, it's really key to, to go in and kind of remediate the soil, mulch it or whatever. And then it's also key to um, replant because, and, and depending on where you are, like willow is a native species. That's a very good, uh, very fast growing tree that also holds, it has deep roots. So you want you know, deep roots to hold that, uh, stop those landslides. Because you know the flood will come, yeah, like the yeah. rain will come at some point and it will become a flood unless yeah, you take so it, measures. Yeah, so we need to raise awareness. Whenever there's a huge fire anywhere in the world, we need to tell people, hey, you better be careful because you're going to have big fires in two years. Um, big floods, yeah, sorry. I mean, big yeah. floods, sorry, yeah. So yeah. unless you kind of go in and really remediate the soil and, and replant. Um, and, and also, does the lack of vegetation and the drought also lead to bigger rain, like bigger spike rain ev like events? Has, has anybody researched that? Like that the rain actually is more concentrated and leads to even bigger floods and instead of being spread out better? Uh, yes. Uh, 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 Anastasia and, and Makareva and, and Victor Gorshov did study stuff also about, we actually may be triggering bigger rains too. Um, but maybe we should get back to that uh, after Sorry, I just finish yeah. this cycle. And then that's a bit more, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's another very important Debatable. aspect of this whole thing. Um, uh, so after the floods, what happens is that huge amounts of topsoil, I mean, that topsoil is like, I mean, it's key to the agriculture and it's key to plant growth, right? And so we're losing a lot of this, uh, a lot of this soil. And so what happens then when you, then have rains over the next two or three years, a lot less is being held in the soil. So you're decreasing the small water cycle. Um, and also, you know, you're decreasing the amount the aquas fill up because those, you need the soil to help guide it into the aquifers. And so it, it's causing a huge problem. And so then you, you're more likely to have droughts uh, a few years later. Um, and so then the cycle continues on and on again. Um, and so again, after floods, it's important to kind of build up the soil. And, you know, I mean, if there are, you know, lots of techniques in regen ag and permaculture to kind of grow soil quickly. Um, and also biodiversity is important. Birds can replant seeds and squirrels and all sorts of animals um, play a role in regenerating uh, ecosystems. So, um, so yeah, so, that, so that's the basic cycle, this, this, this drought, fire, flood cycle um, that, it's, it's, it's such a big deal um, that I really feel like we need to focus on it. And, 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 and you know, you're talking about the whole investing. I think there's a whole investing uh, thing too, because a lot of people can regenerate locally. A lot of the stuff just help deal with, you know, floods or fires or, or droughts. Um, and so insurance companies for one would be very interested in, in, in doing a lot of this, uh, helping ameliorate a lot of this natural disaster. So they could fund some company that's going in lo to local bioregions and initiating, helping people, you know, start these projects because it, because it needs to be done uh, at the local level. It's a, yeah, so yeah, no, it's a, it's a good bridge to to the finance side. I mean, who picks up the bill of these devastating fires and floods in many and droughts as well? Is is either insurance companies or taxpayers? Like we see now, massive payouts in in Spain for the drought. Um, for for farmers and and now the floods and same in Italy. Of course, there will be a lot of work to to restore the houses lost and and all of that. And so you're saying you're mentioning insurance companies and have you seen like have you seen examples of that connection? Almost it feels like this super far away world of insurance companies and and maybe also taxpaying money taxpayers because they pick up the bill at the end of of the floods and of the fires and of the drought as well um to start intervening there or, or to quickly get into action or is that something that we just really have to work on um yeah i'm not quite so clear on like who's uh, how much insurance company i knew i do know in california that they're they're looking for alternative solutions and so they're so they're asking you know because it, they're having to pay out billions and billions of dollars um like PG&E, the, the electric company here, like when, when these things happen, like they're looking for different solutions. Um, I know in China that 
they started a whole sponge city concept because they, they destroyed a lot of their wetlands and other stuff there. Um, and because there's so much people, it's hard for grass to grow and, you know, vegetation to grow. But they started having huge, huge floods, like, um, you know, millions of people was displaced. And so they realized they had to do something. And so they started a sponge city concept where they started putting in wetlands again. They started moving people off floodplains. They, you know, made the rivers curve more so it would slow down. They, 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 they worked on slowing the water um, and they, getting the rain infiltrated into the land. And so the more when big rains come in and infiltrates in the land, then less you're going to have all that water flowing into big cities. So I think there's at, at this time, there's 30 pilot sponge cities and, uh, you know, it's a huge project because the whole Chinese government gets behind it. Um, so that, there's an example where it's having quite a bit of success of implementing a lot of this, uh, slow water, rebuilding soil, you know, rebuilding wetlands, um, moving people off floodplains, uh, strategy. Um, uh, and I do and know- And then in general, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I do know also local governments, you know, cause they can be really concerned about floods. And so they, you know, sometimes, uh, they'll put in bioswales. Bioswales, a, a swale is a, a little indentation in the land so that when rain flows, it, it gets caught in these swales. And so- uh, I know in, in the San Francisco Bay area, like in Alameda, where it's a more danger of flooding, like they'll put in bioswales and different things to capture some of this um, water. And so there's, there's various implements, you know, hodgepodge solutions that local governments do. Um, yeah. And, and if you would be, I mean, there, there, there are a few people listening to this that work in the financial sector, either investing their own money or other people's money. So I always like to ask, of course, without... Uh, giving investment advice, but what would be your main message? I mean, you repeated two things already, like slow water down and, and drought, fire, flood. But if we would record this in a theater in, in California and it's full of, of financial people, quote unquote, uh, what would be the main message you want to send them home with to, uh, to remember from an evening for sure, filled with a lot of information they didn't hear yet. So what would be your main message to, to tell the financial world in either Wall Street or London or or New Delhi, et cetera, to, to take home with uh, about the work you're doing? Well, the return on investment is huge in this area because fires, floods, you know, and droughts are causing billions and billions of dollars, trillions of dollars worldwide, right? So your return on investment is huge if you invest in some of these soil, you know, uh, remediation, you know, stuff like this. And it's it, relatively If cheap. you're able to get the payment. Yeah, if you get able to get somebody to pay for it. That's the, like your return could be huge if you're able to get the... Um, either go local government or or pension funds or figure out a way to to get paid for uh, the value you create you create right because well uh, yeah at the moment you know they're having to pay out billions of dollars when these things happen and so someone's losing but it doesn't mean automatically you get paid if you if you right. save them that money yeah. <laughs> but I do think yeah so I think there's various aspects of people who pay like the government if you can get the government you can get the insurance um, so you could work with local governments, you know, get them to do a partnership and come in and do things. The other thing is that people themselves are very concerned. I mean, you're, everyone's concerned if you're in an area where the natural disaster can happen. And you, if you can lower your risk by 10%, you, you know, there's lots of stuff you can do um, to lower the risk. So, so one of the things I've been proposing is like wildfires. If you can have more groundwater, then you can, um, you know, the, the tree roots can bring up that groundwater during fire season, then you actually lowering your risk maybe by 5%, 10%. But that's a pretty big deal. So, and neighbors can do that. They can build swales and stuff like that. And so you can actually get even the landowners to contribute or even, and, and also do the work. And so people would be, probably a lot of people would be willing to put in a thousand dollars into the kitty and you have all the people in your town putting a thousand dollars each to reduce to lower the risk of a devastating yeah, fire yeah, or, yeah. by five or ten percent yeah like of course yeah, so yeah people would be willing to do that so that's a big kitty there and so i think and and you can do this in various ways you could set up your company as an education company so you could come in and you're educating people on this on on slow water the small water cycle the you know drought five cycle the, the various things you can do is slow it sink it spread it and so you do a training course um and then have people activate themselves, you know, so that could be one way to do it. And I think, you know, and so, and, and what you can do is you can kind of sell, I mean, there's, there's things that go viral now and there's grassroots movement. So you can get some kind of, say, a slow water group in your town. So you set up the structure. So you're guiding, you're guiding the um, inhabitants of that town to, to form these collaborative groups where they come together. 
and they're doing the actions, but maybe they need a little bit of professional help in certain places. And there's certain things you might need to do, like certain earthworks, which are digging certain things to catch the water. Maybe you need professional help to come in and do that work with the tractors and stuff. Um, or if they decide to do permeable pavement, you can set up on the back end the professional services that you bring in, but you're... You're, you're kind of guiding the facilitation process and maybe the local government can pay, but maybe the insurance governments can pay for it. Um, maybe they would also be willing to pay you, you know, for a course you come in and do a course that everyone pays 50, 100 bucks or to take, to learn how they can deal with these natural disasters. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, you can set up some kind of startup that because this is billions and billions or trillions of dollars, like I feel like this is a huge sector that's like right for huge amounts of, I mean, you don't want to be doing this for profit, but there is a lot of money available uh, potentially in this sector. And so what would you do if you had, let's say a billion dollars to invest in this space? Um, how would you put it to work or where would you put it to work? And I'm not asking for specific dollar amounts, but I would ask for what, what would you focus on? What would be the main three parts, four parts, two parts you, you would focus on? Uh, in terms of um, if you had the the luxury and the burden to to put a lot of money to work, in this case, let's say a billion dollars. Okay, so I'd, maybe three prongs. I would do the bi-regional approach, get grassroots movements happening this, around the slow water concept. The second one would be... Which should be relatively cheap. Yeah. That yeah. Be, and then the second one is uh, an educational campaign. So that's where you can actually kind of, yeah. And, and then the third one is, I I really think that you want to kind of bridge academia with this because, uh, you know, in certain countries, the science plays a big role in governments determining it. And so if we can get think tanks and getting academics to kind of do, bring to- I love to, it how you say certain countries, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> certain countries you can do stuff without, they're, they're not so interested in doing the science to the government, to the implement But policy. still, I think there's a lot of this, we're talking about it because in the, in the 2000s, scientists started to be able maybe because of technology and they started measuring a lot of things like otherwise we wouldn't be talking about this so a lot of this this has to be um yeah coming from science actually and from practitioners as well so you would definitely put quite a bit of it to work in in terms of basic science what we don't know yet and what would be main main parts you you're most excited about to to put some scientists to work to to dig deeper well i think modeling uh, and this is kind of where I, you know I, i'm interested in doing some of this work too um is modeling like the, the flood, uh, fire, drought cycle. Um, so figuring ways to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the whole small water cycle and vegetation, like how the vegetation is affecting it, I think more, more, more work needs to be done that. And there are people working on it, but it needs to be expanded. So it goes under different names. One is land atmosphere coupling or vegetation atmosphere coupling. Um, yeah, because that could be huge if we can start showing what to restore where and why like what to plant where and why and what it could potentially trigger or, or less trigger in terms of extreme floods etc but also if you can start bringing back rain in certain periods of the year in certain places that's i mean it sounds like magic and and la la land but it, it does um opens up a whole new world of, of of impact and potential in terms of regeneration not just talking about oh i regenerated my farm however big it is but I actually restored rain up upland, or I actually part I contributed to at X Y Z. I mean, that's that's a very exciting path or a scenario. Yeah. So, um, so Milan Milan is a climate scientist from Spain, and he was asked by the Spanish government to investigate why Spain was losing its rain, and he found that oh, it's because we're destroying the small water cycle. We're we're paving over so much of the land, and we're destroying the forests that that small water cycle is is not contributing to the rain as much as so it's lessening rain. And he did a calculation that said, I mean, it really depends where you are but in the world, but about six miles by six miles is enough to start having an impact on the rain. So you do need to restore that much uh, land to begin having a calculable effect. Um, and it really depends on where you are in the world or like how big the small water cycle contributes to the actual rain. Um, That's massive. We'll, we'll have him later in, in this series. So I'm, I'm definitely going to ask on, on the latest on that and like six by six, I mean, it's not nothing, but it also sounds doable from like a global perspective or a Spain perspective. Even. Yeah. And, and what, it actually impacts the rest of Europe too. Like, um, so the, the air moisture blows in from the ocean and then it goes over Spain and then it goes into the um, Mediterranean Sea, right? 
But if you don't, if you don't capture that r- water vapor, uh, it, it actually impacts the flow of water to the rest of Europe. And I think he wrote a paper saying that certain floods in the rest of Europe were actually due to what's happening in the Spain. And so these continental divides- We're all in this boat together, basically. Yeah, so yeah, we're all in it together. Like floods in Germany were triggered by, um, like the butterfly effect, there were floods in Germany triggered by the vegetation of, of Spain. Hopefully, it resolves a few uh, heated discussions in uh, in Brussels as well, which would be nice. <laughs> yeah, so so there's lots of interconnected because the atmospheric circulation does move to other countries. What you do in one country affects other countries. So a lot of this needs to be more aware of. And so in Spain is one of those places. And the Sinai Peninsula, like Tist van der Hoven, who I interviewed on my podcast, he, they're regreening the Sinai, the Egyptian government, because it used to be possibly. You know, 10,000 years, it was kind of very fertile. And maybe they did this flood drought fire cycle that kind of destroyed some of it um, as, 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 as combined with the kind of wobble in the Earth's orbit. Um, but because they found civilizations and more lush, you know, rivers and stuff flowing through the Sinai Desert, which is all gone now. So they're, tr- they're looking to restore some of that forest um, to the Sinai Desert. But that actually affects the moisture blowing from the um, Mediterranean into the Red Sea and the, and the Indian Ocean. And so they're thinking that, so then that, that will affect all the, because there's a lot of drought in Africa and Middle East, but actually um, some of that, if you can bring down some of that water moisture um, onto the land in the Sinai, then it actually creates wind patterns that actually blows it into Africa and, and the Middle East. So you're actually affecting, and, and you know, in the Middle East, you know, this, you know, there's dangers of water wars because there's such a lack of water, but you could actually possibly bring back water. So, so that's a, that could be a key, you know, an, another key AccuPoint project. And so you want to look around the world too, where there's key restoration projects, which actually affect the atmospheric circulation in a way that actually impacts a lot of the world. So, um, and, you know, Anastasia. Yeah, I think they're called their, we, we had Maddie on, on the, on the podcast and they called their company the, the weather makers, which is very, um, yeah, it's, it's a perfect, perfect title, but also it sounds in many cases complete magic and co- way too good to be true. And I think they had a big interview, I think it was in The Guardian, uh, with a title, I'm going to put it down in the description, um, in the show notes, but something like, we lack the imagination to believe that this could be possible. And that's probably the case. Like if you start talking about um, restoring some of the rains and water cycles in, in the Middle East and also East Africa and the Horn of Africa, I mean, Somalia is just suffering an, a massive flood as, a flood as we speak. But also I think they were talking about um, the it's not called the hurricanes in in the Indian Ocean, but anyway, the, the massive storms uh, that that battle uh, a lot of that w- are triggered by water vapor as well. So there's a lot of that connecting this. But as soon as you start talking about that, I think a lot of investors and people are just going to say, okay, that's just too too complex, too big. Like where to start, where to start, and what kind of 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 effects we have. This is just way over my head. So let's um, let, let's click to the next one or let's ignore uh, because it just gets too much. I think so. It's also we have to be aware of not, I think, not over complexify, but also um, make it for many people that just start paying attention to water cycles, not make it too, too big or too massive, even though it is connected, but to watch out for that effect. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Although there are some big projects that are happening, like in Africa, there's this whole great green war project. And, uh, and in China, they did, you know, massive restoration. So, yeah, so maybe those people who are kind of doing it, you could, but uh, on other projects, maybe it's uh, a little bit, uh, yeah, you maybe want I mean, to think It's great if it happens, but, but it should yeah. have, I mean, it's, it should happen also, like these projects should happen um, because of the local impact and the regional impact. And then it's amazing if it has impact like continents further. Um, but let's, because we don't know, right. um, these are many suggestions. We don't have the models to, to, we don't have the examples nor the models to, to tell us, but you would definitely focus on these with, with your fund, let's say, um, on these acupuncture points, which could have these massive effects to three continents down the line, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I also want to bring up Africa here because I think Africa is a really sad case in that like the, a lot of people were able to actually create their own food and all that stuff. But what's happening is that the the Sahara, for instance, is is desertifying at really fast rate. And what happens in some of these African countries is that they chop down some of the trees for firewood, and a lot of the stuff is getting destroyed. and um, And so it's no longer able to absorb the rain, and so it creates it, it creates more desertification and less less rain. And so 
And a lot of people in Africa have talked about how when they watched as stuff got cut down, forests got cut down and stuff, that the rain disappeared. And so I think because there is a lot of aid coming into Africa to help with, you know, starvation and all sorts of other issues. But I think if they actually focus on regenerating the, the, the soil and other stuff and doing permaculture, there's people doing small scale permaculture things, but these projects could be much on a much larger scale. Um, they could actually do a lot of good to, that has multiple effects on food and other issues and health uh, in Africa. And so maybe some of these NGOs and other stuff could be, be investing in this approach. Um, and, and they could, they could learn a bit from the Indian approach. So India, there's something called the Pani cup. And, uh, and then I was talking to, um, Minnie Jen, um, she, uh, on one of my podcast, she, she works in India with over a thousand, their projects is uh, called the, uh, flow partnership that they've worked with a diff thousand different villages. And so what they do is they get the villages to, um, self-organize to talk about the water situation, come up with a solution, but also to learn what other villages do because traditionally there's a lot of ways they call them johads which are kind of the swales and the ponds that capture the water in and so they'll build these ponds and johads and swales to capture the rain so that it stays there so they have enough water for the dry season and the crops keep growing because a lot, a lot of the crops are dying and people go back to the big cities and don't leave the small town so this project has reinvigorated the local agricultural scene and also gave them drinking water and all sorts of stuff. But basically it's a very bottom up approach. And so that's why they can work with that many groups on a small budget. Um, um, and I feel like this kind of approach um, would be very useful in Africa. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I've, we've recently begun talking to some of the people in Africa. It's really dire. I mean, like as sad it is in, in like, <laughs> you know, Europe or America or, or even in, you know, like, India or um, China, it's really sad in, in a a Africa. And, uh, um, and we're going in, you know, with, you know, with the smartphone and all the EV technologies, we're mining the heck out of like, say the Congo for these lithium and like destroying all the water cleanliness. Anyway, like, because we're treated Africa as this mining thing that we can mine for all our computer and stuff, we're not realize we're not paying attention to that. And that's destroying all the, all the land there. And it's really destroying the water stuff. Um, so it's extremely sad and it's causing a lot of wars and other stuff there. Um, so, so you definitely focus a big chunk of, of your fund to, to invest in, in, on the continent basically, and focus on the, the acupuncture points there. Yeah. Because I think it's, ha it has, I mean, it has huge ripple effects, like just because this, yeah, I mean, I mean, like then if you actually restore the thing, then you have less of this huge immigration into Europe, you know, recently with all the Africans and. You know, I mean, like people worry about these climate migrations, but if you can actually restore some of that thing, that, that, that affects. And then also because the, the large atmospheric circulation, what happens in the Africa um, is actually impacting the everybody elsewhere yeah. too. Um, um, and, and, you know, in Milan, Milan, and, uh, and also Anastasia Macarib, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, because they were saying that the water blows into the Indian Ocean and stuff like that is actually creating more hurricanes there. And so the Pakistan you know, the recent floods may have been to do with the, all the extra water moisture that didn't get captured when it blew over the Sinai Desert in Africa. And so then it creates more, that moisture then is more likely to form hurricanes that then create atmospheric rivers and blow. So like there's this huge ripple effect. So I don't know, I think it'd be, it'd be good for us to focus our attention of what's happening in Africa um, because, it, because everything is so connected um, that, that it has big effects on everything else. And as a final question, which usually leads to other questions, but um, if you, unfortunately, you, you no longer have your fund, but you do have a magic uh, wand, a magic power to change one thing and, and one thing only, what would you change overnight? Could be make everybody aware of something or could be capture all rain. I mean, could be literally anything. Uh, but only one thing. I mean, I would kind of capture, uh, bridge this kind of, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. But I mean, there's multiple things I could say, but one thing is to bridge the climate movement to the land work movement, mm -hmm. the permaculture, agroecology, regenerative ag thing. And what's your main argument there to, to get them into the room? Um, like, hey, water vapor is important. Or like, what's like, what's an opening sentence you can use in that? I'm asking because like, 
so much attention goes into the carbon space and the climate space, right. rightfully so, but it feels like the rest is a bit ignored and it plays a massive role in cooling and, and uh, heating and cooling as we discussed before. Like what's your opening sentence to, let's say a climate scientist to get him or her interested in, in the, the water stuff, quote unquote. Uh, well, first, that to look at some of the work that some of the climate scientists are doing is just not getting enough attention around the whole small water cycle, precipitation recycling, and that this work is has been done by some scientists. Um, and then in terms of like the cooling effect, like I think that's a huge thing that people, um, because what happens is the water vapor, um, it's like sweating. So it brings up that heat from the earth. And then it moves it up high in the atmosphere. And then when it's high in the atmosphere, that heat, when it gets released again, when you form clouds, it doesn't have to go through as much um, of the greenhouse gases uh, lower down. And so then it can actually radiate into space. And so it can actually cool the planet, this water. So we can make the planet sweat, literally. Yeah. And so it, it definitely, the, a lot of climate scientists agree that it's locally cooling. They don't necessarily agree as much that it's globally cooling. But like if they look at the work of Anastasia, Makarev, and Gorshkov, they're kind of doing... They're, they're pinpointing some of the areas in the climate model is like, uh, maybe it's a little too technical to get into, but there's a certain way they parameterize everything um, with the convection, convective adjustments that doesn't take into account the forest evapotranspiring and various things. And so I, I think we need to focus a little bit on attention that, that these two have been pointing out about the areas in some of these climate sciences that then would raise a lot more attention that actually it's actually can cool the planet. I mean, intuitively, you can make a lot of sense. I mean, you move that water vapor higher into the air where it releases heat so it doesn't have to go through a greenhouse gas so it can escape in space. So then you cool the planet. Um, so it's playing a huge role um, in cooling the planet. But it's been completely under-modeled. Or, or need, let, I think what Yana said like, was too difficult to model, so we didn't look at it. And that sounds a bit sad and interesting, but also a huge opportunity. Like There is this um, pot potential, and we need a lot more research, that there is a way to cool the planet, and we're definitely overheating. Um, with vegetation, with healthy soils, with healthy forests, etc., that has not been part of the current, let's say, the the broader mainstream climate discussion. And and it should be at least it should be part of the discussion, and we should look into it. Not saying we shouldn't, of course, the the emissions and and fossil fuels, etc., but at least let's investigate the, the the potential cooling of of healthy vegetation, um, and and have the let's say the earth sweat a bit more. Yeah, I think, yeah, if you want to put investment money, like one place you might get a lot of return investment is investing in, because she's, they're, they're bringing a lot more scientists into that mixture, kind of creating a think tank around this and just putting a lot more energy and research into this because more and more scientists are kind of starting to agree with this. Um, and that, that will have ripple effects. But it can be faster. Yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, because, and we can also, and that group maybe could also do this research on this flood, f drought, fire cycle. Um, which probably triggers, I mean, the drought has to do with heat. The, the flood has to do with heat or cooling. The, the fire definitely needs heat. So there is a, there is a, a very important heat component locally, but also uh, in, in, on the larger system. Let's say that's completely, um, yeah, we only look at the greenhouse gases on a global level and that, that's sort of it instead of looking at um, the potential of, of cooling of vegetation. And I think if we look at satellites over the last, or imagery and, and models, we've devegetated quite a bit. So it's not, I mean, some places have definitely gained tree cover and uh, Europe is one of them, uh, but then we can argue uh, what's the level, the diversity, et cetera, and how much does it help? Or is it a large forest? We just did an interview in, in um, let's say, north of Costa Brava, and, and there's a lot of forest, but it's overgrown um, monoculture forest that was abandoned 100 years ago. That's not a healthy forest, and you can see it, it's suffering. And, and it needs a lot of work to be able to play a, a role again in the cycle. It, it's currently not, um, and, or it's currently playing a role, but not a very uh, uh, constructive one, let's say more a destructive one. So there's, yeah, there's forest and forest and tree and trees and trees. Um, but I want to thank you so much for your time Wait, and, can and I just the work say one you more do. Thing? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so of course. like one thing, and just that not the that investment, the education thing, like one thing, like there's a whole permaculture, they have a whole way of doing permaculture cause I think creating a climate permaculture like bringing those things together and then creating education, training a lot of people, like that way you can kind of create some money to, you know, educate as well. Or, or you create your own kind of thing like Elaine Ingram did with the Soil Food Web, kind of training people, train people in learning about these connections and then, you know, and so that's, that's another investment opportunity. Yeah, no, there's, there's a, 
an opportunity on the education piece. It's not easy. I mean, what Elaine did is is absolutely um, amazing to to be able to create an education piece out of it. I think Zach is doing quite a bit of that. Zach Wise and and others. It's of course, um, but because of the technology we have now, I mean, we're recording this online. Yes, there's lithium, which has been mined horribly in many cases, but it also enables us to do uh, to to write on Substack and to record this. Um, so there is there are opportunities now for crazy uh, drought, fire, flood videos to go viral, and there there is this this tech to be available to available to us. So we def we definitely should use it and and trigger because yeah, education can be global and can be I'm not saying instant, uh, but at least much more structured or much faster than than not so long ago where it had to go through multiple cycles of scientists, then into school. Uh, curriculum, and then we had to wait 20 years before people were in some kind of position of, of any kind of power, and that's just way too slow at the moment. Yeah, it, it actually, it may, like maybe like a carbon tax, like there's a carbon tax, right? So there's maybe a water tax. Like when you buy your EV and your lithium batteries and your smartphones, think about what you're doing to destroy Congo and like put in some money that helps, you know, remediate the soil and the stuff in, in, in Congo and other African countries. Um, so yeah, so that's a way to kind of maybe funnel money from all our yeah, computer and water stuff seems to be more really, connected. You know, yeah, destroying really traffic. water intensive. Yeah, absolutely. And so, with that, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for what you do in the space. Obviously, I will link as much as um, as possible in in the show notes below. And I thank you so much for coming on here and share um, the, the a fascinating look into into water. There's way more to do. We're gonna covered in from all different angles um, but thank you so much for for coming on here and and share thank you really appreciate it thank you so much for listening all the way to the end for the show notes and links we discussed in this episode check out our website investing in regenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts if you like this episode why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on apple Podcasts? that really helps thanks again and see you next time Thank you.